Mulweni and welcome to another beautiful the rundown of the social show. My name is Vio Cholwana, as it says in the title of the show. Uh, we, we we work to bring you good news uh, or bring you at least the CSI, CSR, as well as CSV aspect of your society, of your industry, of your um, sector. If you don't know what's going on in your sector and CSI, CSR, as well as CSV, well, you are tuned into the right show if you'd like to send a query and on the question or you have an initiative in mind please don't be afraid to send me an email at press at social dash tv otherwise you can catch me on twitter at brand live radio facebook www.brandlive.co.za or you can just call in call in it's a gloomy gloomy thursday we don't have a president Ah. <laughs> you can just sit, call me on 011-083-8606. Of course, it's a beautiful day in Johannesburg. It's raining and I just, I pray for the rain to eventually reach Cape Town and uh, help them out a little bit. But before we get into that and we get into what we're actually going to be talking about today in the show, let's start off with the news. Drinks company SodaStream South Africa has joined the call to action urging Coca-Cola to develop a plan to ensure Cape Town residents have access to water. This follows a petition released earlier this week by Avaz, a global web movement that brings people uh, powered politics to decision making. The petition titled Coca-Cola Save Cape Town from a Water Apocalypse calls on the bottling company to disclose local sources of water in Cape Town to urgently develop a plan ensuring residents have access to water. Avaz especially calls on Coca-Cola Cola to disclose local sources of water in Cape Town to provide open access to the groundwater extraction to the public and cut Coca-Cola production by half for the duration of the crisis. And lastly, to distribute bottled water for free to residents across Cape Town. In other news, held at the Rustenburg Wine Estate in Celebosch, this year's Cape Wine Auction has raised over $17.5 million for education in the Cape Winelands. The day's highest bid was over 700000 and went for the Onrick French Revere lot, which included five nights in a private villa in Cannes in, in, Cannes in France, uh, a Revere for eight people and a lunch or dinner in a private dining room of South African chef Jan Hendrik van der Weesthuis and Jan, the award-winning m- uh, star restaurant, who has a, a star restaurant uh, in Nice. Uh, four signed magnum bottles of sold out first quantum grand reserve Bordeaux style 2011 blend were included in the package. The Cape Wine auction sponsored by Ned Bank Private Wealth is regarded as one of the most significant international wine charity auctions ever conceived in South Africa, uniting the industry around a single goal of raising money for education. And lastly in our news, Walk In My Shoes is a collaborative social justice campaign run by its partners, the Kalisa Social Solutions, the Tuli Matunzela Foundation and PUJ Powers. And it's set to launch on the 20th of February, coinciding with World Day of Social Justice. Kalisa Social Solutions' partnership with Professor Tuli Matunzela and the Tuli Matunzela Foundation aims to significantly and sustainably reduce the number of South Africans intertwined in poverty cycle, in the poverty cycle rather, through improving access to social justice in communities across South Africa. The event aims to provide an opportunity for marginalized voices to be heard, including underprivileged school-going children, ex-offenders, members of the LGBT community, domestic violence and rape survivors, victims of xenophobia, community members from Cliptown and the homeless, both rural and urban. And that concludes our news for the day. The jobs and economy of the future will be urban. By 2030, 60% of the global population will live in cities. To ensure decent work and economic growth, local leaders face many challenges. 40 million jobs need to be created every year for young people entering the labour market. Depending on the developing region, between 45 and 90% of workers are in the informal economy. There are 168 million children in child labour worldwide. Women's average wages are between 4 to 36% less than men's. Many local governments are already taking action. Fostering community participation and social dialogue between employers and workers 
including in the informal economy, adapting and responding to economic trends and challenges, promoting entrepreneurship, job-oriented policies, innovation and labour protection, and learning from one another through city-to-city -city cooperation. Local and regional governments do all this to ensure inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for all, which is Goal 8 of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Achieving SDG 8 depends on local governments. The world is becoming increasingly urban. We'll need to build a new city for one million people every week to keep up or manage the growth of the cities we already have. The battle for sustainable development will be won or lost in our cities, working with the rural areas on which they depend for food and natural resources. Mayors and local governments are already taking action to win this battle. We provide basic services and work with slum dwellers and neighbourhoods to upgrade their living conditions. We improve air quality by investing in public transport and green mobility. We protect the environment through sustainable waste management. We tackle urban segregation by ensuring quality green and public spaces for all. We protect urban cultural heritage for future generations. We monitor and regulate land use to make cities more resilient to climate change and disasters. We involve our communities in planning for inclusive and sustainable urbanization. Local and regional governments seek strong partnerships with national governments to ensure enabling legal frameworks and adequate resources and play our full role in achieving Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is Sustainable Cities and Communities. The Sustainable Development Agenda depends on local governments. You're back on the social show and uh, I think you kind of saw the kind of mood that I'm in. I'm talking a little bit about uh, local government, cities, making sure that we are coherent, we are all together and we are all uh, uh, making sure that we have a sustainable working government and that's not any fi shots fired. No shots fired. I promise you that. I'm just saying. In anyway, Monash South Africa launched an MS, uh, MSA lead, which is a leading entrepreneur's a program for African Development in 2016, a fellowship program for young social entrepreneurs between the ages of 16 to 29 years old. And the program is sort of a result of um, their global partnership with MSA, the International Youth Foundation, and the Laureate uh, International Universities. Implemented by MSA, the uh, program identifies and supports young social entrepreneurs across South Africa while strengthening the regional youth and social innovation sector as a whole. And I know if you are an avid listener of The Social Show, you know that Thursdays I do my best to make sure that we bring you a young, up-and-coming social entrepreneur because I think it's very important that we do give a voice to our young leaders who are pioneering innovative solutions to urgent and social and environmental challenges. Um, and these young visionaries uh, are really been, uh, you know, a powerful force, uh, can be a powerful force while they've given the opportunity to develop these much needed skills, um, giving them access to additional resources and really to learn from them and also to see collaboration within them. I'm such a big fan of social entrepreneurship years and today on the show I'm speaking to one uh, of them uh, part of the SMSA lead program his, his name is Terry Matibula he's from Soweto and he is going to talk to us a little bit about hustle nomics hustle nomics it sounds so interesting thank you so much are you, are you on the line Terry hello good day how are you this morning I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm I, really good morning. I am perfect. I'm so happy about the rain. <laughs> okay, so Hustle Nomics. Uh, tell us a little bit more about, let's first start off with who you are, right? Your history um, and how it sort of shaped you to be who you are today and to be in, in sort of the space that you're in right now. All right. Um, I am a 30-year-old young man I'm from Soweto, born and bred. Um, I was educated here in Johannesburg, matriculated in St. Barnabas, 
um, college staff of Johannesburg, which was a college that basically took in students from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds from across the country mm. uh, to shape their futures. Um, I then graduated in computer and information systems um, in 2010, uh, which I have an honors of. Uh, then went into project management, customer services, um, changed to um, a facilitator in an SET college in the middle of project room at some point. Wow. Um, came back into customer services. Um, then finally decided to go out of corporate and focus on my business, my business partner, yeah. who's also my brother in Tanjango, um, which we are running now, um, the Hasselnomics company. Lovely. And do you think, do you think your journey is part of what made you fall in love with social entrepreneurship? Because it sounds like you sort of ate from different bowls and then you finally got to the heart of what it is you wanted to do. So what exactly got you and perhaps your brother to fall in love with being a social entrepreneur before we get into hustle economics? Um, falling in love with social entrepreneurship is, is I think for me, is a, has been a journey um, for quite a few years. Ever since I was in school, um, I think... I've, I've had the blessing of caring for people because I come from a home where my mother took care of everybody yes. even outside of just us. Um, uh, so that taught me to basically look at even my peers, um, how, what conditions they come from, what they needed, yeah. um, and compared, kind of compared it to the types of access that I, I would have in yeah. terms of education, the home that I have, um, opportunities that I had. Um, for instance, uh, when I was in high school, I'd identify just amongst my, my friends, those who couldn't afford to go to school, take up my savings because uh, the pocket money that my parents would give me, I would prioritize um, for just giving assistance to those wow. who couldn't for themselves or those who came from homes that basically couldn't provide for them so yeah. that I would try and give them opportunities that I, I, I had. Um, and growing into that, I realized that um, I had the heart to work with people a lot. I mean, mm. I studied IT, um, but my first first job that I went into was project management because I knew I would be working with people yeah. and ultimately I'll be assisting people even if it was in the corporate world um, so that that kind of it, it was Sparked. instance of my journey that kind of identified the type of individual that I am yeah. and, and the personality that I have in, in, in having uh, the heart to assist people and having the heart to basically identify yeah. that in all that I do, um, I need to have an impact in yes. people's lives. I need to leave an impact that people will forever remember. Definitely. And that's such an amazing quality to have when you're a new business owner, you getting into business because it's almost, uh, you, you, in, you know, engulfed in purpose and in, in profit with purpose. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got uh, involved with the MSA lead program? Where did you hear about it? What was your initial uh, thought process when you got into, in, into the program and, and how did it shape you? Um, you know, obviously looking at the fact that you already had it in you. Sure. Um, so having to start our business, um, we registered our business in 2015 and we've been knocking in different doors um, to get into different programs. The first door that we knocked on was NYTA, which led to other competitions yes. um, about our idea um, that we were finalists in. And I think it was last year when we were the finalists in the Spark International WICA program wow. um, that we heard about the MSA LEAD program. Um, we then were referred to apply for that. We did apply. Um, fortunately, we got into the program and that opened a lot of doors as well because I, I, I got to meet great people that were in my 
own space of work or social entrepreneurship mm. that understood the work that I'm doing. Yes. Um, um, being an impact-driven business mm. um, so that we we can change the world and, and hopefully make the world a better place. Definitely. Um, so that taught me, that basically taught me to interact with people um, meet great people that I could network with and potentially co- collaborate, collaborate with mm. um, so that my business could grow so that I could have a greater impact in my own um, community. community. 100%. Okay, now let's get into hustle-nomics. I keep saying hustle-economics, hustle-nomics. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Hustle-nomics. Hustle-nomics. Oh, thank you. So tell us a little bit about it, the business. What is it that you are? Um, what is it? That, what, what service are you giving and, and how does it benefit your community? Okay, so the idea of Hustlenomics basically came from identifying um, backyard checks in 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 our community. Um, so in we we live in Soweto. Yes. And just to tell you a little story about that, um, so our grandmother's house has always been a like a four roomed house. It's a two bedroom, a kitchen, and a dining room. And at some point, because of family growth we have to create our own space to to live in and create privacy and so forth. Yeah. So my brother, who's my business partner, decided to build a shack for us on the outside for the boys. Yeah. So so that we could have some privacy. And that led him to go study um, as a bricklayer, which gave wow. him the qualities to build. Yeah. So we got together at some point and decided to build a formal structure uh, which has four units which could accommodate majority of us and give us more space to live in and, wow. and privacy. So the idea basically came from that in identifying that this was not just our problem, but it was our problems amongst our yes. peers, amongst our neighbors. Um, and because of the, the qualities we had, he, he started building, and we started using this as a business as well. Yes. We started building for people around the community. Yes. But because we identified this as a problem, we sat down and thought about, about how we could assist people because most people don't, don't afford to get home financing yes. to improve their homes. Uh, most people in the townships uh, are probably unemployed. Yes. So the idea was to basically remove backyard checks in townships for low-income households. Yes. And replace those with formal structures uh, wow. made of brick and mortar. And ultimately, the idea grew to us using alternative uh, building technology, which is interlocking bricks um, wow. to build our structures, which are more green buildings wow. that we are deploying right now. That is beautiful. Um, so, <laughs> wow, you, because I'm seeing, you know what I'm so seeing? We, I'm seeing three different things being tackled at once, which is providing good spaces, functional living spaces, like you said, but also you're going green and also you're giving people pl- employment in, in, in some sort of way. So I think, I think it's a triple threat, which I think is amazing. Um, just to um, give a little bit more about our, our, our model as well. Yeah. So we provide these structures at no cost to the homeowners, right? Most people would ask, how do you then make money from this because you're a for-profit business? Um, we then, because these are for, normally four-unit structures, we put in tenants in these uh, units so that we can recoup the initial cost that we we put into the project yeah. and make a little bit of the profit over a certain period that is yeah. agreed upon between us and the homeowner. And the home de- yeah. Um, so what we do is in the four units we place tenants. In the first year we collect until we we break even. Um, in the second year we then give one unit to the owner. The third year we give another unit to the owner up until we give the whole structure to the owner and then we step out leaving them with a proper structure that is providing a sustainable living for them. That's amazing. That is that is that just blew my mind. I don't even know what to say. Can you just tell me where donors and potential investors can get a hold of you? Um and just tell us a little bit about your future and what you hope your business will be, just to conclude. Um okay. Um people can get a hold of us on we have a Facebook right now. Unfortunately we don't have a website yet. Um, for certain reasons. Yeah. Um, 
So people have been asking us, how do we market our business? We currently just uniquely identifying people around the townships who have backyard checks. Yeah. Then we then assess the situation, whether they have the ability to build for themselves or not. Yeah. And we take it from there. So we've just recently created a, way, uh, a Facebook page called Hustlenomics where people can reach us or they can get a hold of us on our email, Hustlenomics, yes. which is spelled H-U-S-T-L-E-N-O-M-I-C-S-X at gmail.com. Lovely. And is, is there... Um, or I okay. can alternatively give them my uh, mobile number, which I use for work, which is 072 644 Can you say that again? Zero seven two. Yes. Six double four nine five zero three. Lovely. Wow, I am I'm literally blown away about the uh, about this specific innovation because I think it's so multi-layered. I have to commend you and say all the best. I really do hope that your business will become more sustainable and you'll give more people uh, functional living spaces, which I think is such an important, important thing, especially when you're looking at the weather today. Thank you so much, Terry, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a brilliant day. And thank you to your listeners as well. <laughs> Wow, I am so, I am so excited about this project, Hustlenomics. If you can, if you didn't hear him properly, you know that you can go on his Facebook page and find out a little bit more about what they're doing. I think it's amazing. I think um, this is what I when I think innovation and when I think entrepreneurship, this is what I think of. I think of people who see a problem, see a gap, see an issue, and then they try and, and solve it in the best way that they can. And I have to say, Terry and his brother are doing something that is isn't easy. It isn't easy to identify people. People who aren't living in spaces that um, are, are are functional, but more than that, that are going to be able to maintain them, and and and, and the, even the process in which they put it together to say you can you can go yearly as to how you pay it and you can negotiate. It's very very flexible for people in the township. I think it's something that can even move from township to township. Looking at Soweto, looking at um, uh, where, I, where, you know, where I'm from, uh, Eastern Cape, Ukim Tanzane, Guko, all of these really big townships where people have these informal set- settlements that are not, um, you know, necessarily uh, safe. And I think what happens is when you have uh, people like like Terry and people and companies like Castlenomics, people have options. And isn't that what the world is for? Isn't that what um, being young and being driven is for? Giving people options, giving people new ways of looking at how housing, giving people new ways of looking at shelter. Well done to Terry Matibula, part of the MSA lead program from Manesh and uh, speaking to us a little bit about Hustlenomics. Uh, We'll take a short break and we'll be back with things to remember. Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastownmedia.co.za. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. You must know this beautiful, beautiful, uh, dramatic sound by now. It's time for things to remember, that time of the show where I just leave you with something to think about, something to go about your day, something to debate with, with your friend, with your spouse. It was Valentine's Day yesterday. Something to debate with uh, someone at work. Something just to think about when you're by yourself. Um, these, 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 these little snippets and these little um, comments are, are comments that are readily available to you if you just go online. But I always want to give people something to, 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 to just take away with them, if anything, um, about today's show. Let's listen to the clip and then we'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. Earlier this week, we were on the Kwakwa campus where we introduced the No to Racism and Yes to Equality campaign. I want to thank the SRC and the Institute for driving this very important uh, message. South Africa's original problem was not race. South Africa's original problem was different. We do not know how to deal with people whom we think are different from us. 
the first and most important thing to do is to acknowledge that there is a problem. You can't fix something if you don't believe it exists. Take risks. You're not going to change a country like ours if you don't take risks. May we all deeply in our hearts, every time we see a problem, say no to racism, but also yes to equality. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming here this afternoon. It's important that we name the problem, that we enact. We're saying no is evident. Righty, so that was the former UFS uh, Vice Chancellor, Jonathan Janssen, as he's speaking a little bit about uh, saying no to racism in his university space. Of course, we don't remember, we remember the sort of racist rants and, and st uh, racist stories that were coming out of UFS, especially the uh, you know predominantly Afrikaans uh, universities. And in, in, in essence, I think all universities and all institutions of higher learning had some sort of... Uh, uh, <sighs> call to action against no saying no to racism and i just uh, i wanted to speak a little bit about his point which was um our problem is not race it's difference and i wonder if uh, that is is something that you hold true to yourself if you're thinking about uh, the past and you understand the past of south africa do you do you see it as a difference thing as not being able to understand difference or do you see it as really just understanding that uh, uh race exists and in its existence, we are able to we we we, do, we cannot enforce our political ideas or even our emotional or or, or um, whatever affiliations connotations we have with um, just the the color of someone's skin. And it's no um, it's no uh, secret that people who are a little bit darker in almost all societies in all uh, countries are treated a little bit differently badly um and, and and i found it quite interesting that he used that approach i found it a little bit um uh i found it a little bit too clean and safe so i want to know what you think don't forget to hit me up on brand life radio on www.brandlife.co.za to find out and racism saying no to racism is one thing but also saying um we identify differences is it a difference thing or is it a race thing and and does the differences making making it the, the, the conversation about differences um water down racism uh, a little bit and, and gives you know those who are racist uh, you know get, puts them off gets them off a little bit gives them an easy way out um to say i don't tolerate i can't tolerate differences than to say i don't tolerate uh, you know racism i don't know uh you tell me Tell me on 011-083-8606. Um, this has been a great show, actually. I spoke to Terry, who is an amazing, amazing uh, social entrepreneur, um, who's doing big things. And I know for a fact he's going to get a call or three from some potential investors. We got to talk a little bit about hustle and economics and how it's working. And if you want to know a little bit more, I urge you to go on our Facebook at Brand Live Radio. And you'll find it on Twitter. You'll find it as well in case you, you missed out. And also, he did say his, his phone number if you want to call him directly. And that will be available in the podcast that will follow on www.social-tv.co.za where you will get your very latest CSI, CSR, as well as Shared Value News. This is Viva Kulana signing out. Thank you. I'll see you again. Same time, same place, 9.30 till 10 on The Social Show. You're listening to brandlive.co.za.